Hello guys, I hope you're all doing well. You'll have to excuse, I might have a little bit of a lisp today. I just went to the dentist and I'm still a little bit numb. But I figured I would film this sit down kind of Q&A style, story time style situation because I do get asked so so often uh, about what degrees I have, where I studied, what I studied and if I have any tips and tricks because I've literally been studying constantly without a break for the last 20 years out of my 24 years of life. So I actually have made some notes because it was a long time ago and I forgot, so I just sort of like jotted it down. Uh, but basically, I went to private school my entire life. I was never a super smart kid. I would say I was always above average, but I generally didn't prioritize school very much. I was a sporty kid. I, at any given time, was doing two or three sports. My sports were gymnastics, track and field, AFL, touch football and soccer and I also was doing AMEB classic piano practice and theory all the way up until grade 12. So I did science subjects, biology and chemistry and maths uh, and I also did French in school and I pretty much got consistently like low A's. English was my worst subject for sure, it always has been. Uh, at my school, we every single year had to do some kind of like performance or like soliloquy or play, and I just hated that so much. And we did like really classic novels, which I hated, and I just, I don't consider myself a necessarily creative person. I hated writing, and I just wasn't very good at it. Yes, I was very much like a science maths kid, and I loved science, and I was super keen and super involved. I was in high school a part of like science club, maths club, and I also, was a part of the titration competition. We got to state level, which is like a chemistry thing. I also did the National Youth Science Forum in grade 12, which is like this nationwide program that runs for like two weeks for kids who want to get into like STEM. And it was super competitive and I was so surprised to get in because like I said, like I'm not top, I was never like the brightest kid, uh, but I tried really hard. <laughs> and so I was super stoked to get in. And that was like such like a peak point in my high school life was going to this basically camp program and like seeing like state of the art scientists and just like conferences and networking and just being around like so many like like minded kids who were just like obsessed with science. And from that, I then went on to work as a peer leader for the National New Science Forum. And then I actually also got accepted into the London International New Science Forum from there. I applied early for a couple of university programs. I had always wanted my first preference to be the Bachelor of Medical Science from the Australian National University, which is in Canberra. I live in Brisbane, I grew up in Brisbane. So it's like over a thousand kilometers away. And that was, that was always my first preference because I liked the look of the program and there was no medical science program where I lived. Everywhere was biomedical science and they had honours embedded. And at the time I was like, mm, I don't know how I feel about research, don't want to commit. So that was my first preference. I got some early offers to do genetics in Sydney, um, biomed in Melbourne and one other, I think like science degree just generally and I was just yeah really holding out until hopefully I got that medical science offer at ANU which I ended up getting at the end of grade 12 which was awesome just seeing if I missed anything also what I did in high school was I did work experience so when I was 15 uh, this was not mandatory or anything I like went out of my way to like source this because again I was like almost to the level of cringing how keen I was. <laughs> so I contacted like local hospitals and things and I was like, hey, do you take like students to just come in and observe? And so during the holidays, I went to like a local hospital and uh, the radiology department was the only department that would take me. So the only surgeries that I was able to see were those where imaging was required. But yeah, it was really, it was an awesome experience. Like I was seeing surgeries. I think the first surgery I ever saw was like a hip replacement. And if you've ever seen any kind of ortho surgery it's like the surgeon's standing on the table and they're like you know crazy it's like super violent anyway that was a super good experience and i think if i could just give like one piece of advice it would be like yes study hard and try hard and like know what your motivation is but 
above all else is just like be proactive do things that set you aside from other people volunteer do work experience be a part of extracurriculars don't just be like a smart kid do sport like contribute to the community like just be as well-rounded as possible is what i would say I then moved to Canberra to study at the National University, which was like my dream. And all in all, it was like such a positive experience. I moved down there when I was 17, as soon as I finished high school and was like living on my own. It was such a foreign concept. I had a pretty strict upbringing. So it was pretty much a crazy adjustment for me to just like go living on my own and just be like, wow, I can do whatever I want. And I partied a lot, I went out a lot, I was super, super social, and I don't have any regrets, but again, my piece of advice would be always prioritize your schoolwork. I don't think I was a very good studier. I was really passive, I would make notes, I would read notes, I would just watch lecture. And I think now in hindsight, I know about active recall, space repetition, and just, you know, constantly reviewing material, but in a constructive way, if that makes sense. So not just like reading things you know, making questions, making yourself, you know, test yourself on the actual knowledge. So in my first year of university, I volunteered as a medic, a medical volunteer with an organization called International Volunteer HQ, IV, IVHQ uh, in Vietnam. And I was there for over a month. I was living there and working there. I would work from like 7 a.m. to like 5 p.m. every single day in one of the local hospitals. It was actually a trauma and ortho hospital. And some of my best memories were from that trip. It was the most humbling, most eye-opening kind of situation. I learned a lot of skills on that trip, actually. I was taught how to take manual blood pressure. I was taught how to cannulate, how to take blood. I was taught how to do uh, basic wound care, cleaning out wounds, which like you would never get that kind of experience in Australia if you weren't already qualified as some kind of health practitioner. So that was awesome. Like you meet again, some like really black minded people and like, I have been meaning to go back and do another one. I really want to go to Nepal, but like obviously they're currently on pause as far as I'm aware because of COVID. I also pretty much every single university holidays would shadow multiple physicians, usually in the private sector because it's more like up to them. I would send out like 100 emails to every single specialist in Canberra and probably get like six response responses saying okay yeah you can like come and stand in the corner and like just watch what I do and I'm just like thank you so much like I would I don't want to be on holidays I want to be learning things and I want to be seeing cool things about the human body so I think I actually would have shadowed easily 15 doctors during my undergrad I did like three or four different neurosurgeons whether it was brain or spine like periphery as well I did OBGYN, I did uh, cardiac, psychiatry, anatomical pathology, so like autopsies and stuff, amazing. Uh, and basically, yeah, I just got like a feel of different specialties and what I might like to do in the future, which was something that was really valuable because some of the things I was like, oh yeah, I could do that. I went in there and I was like, heck no, that's not for me. I also, um, I guess, expressed interest to a couple of different science programs for like younger kids. So things like Conoco Phillips, which is like for high school students. And then there was this also this other one called, I can't even remember what it was called, but it was based um, out of the University of Adelaide. And it was just like for, I guess, troubled youths or low, socio low socioeconomic individuals who were between the ages of like 10 and 13. They would like come away into wine country. It was so beautiful and do like this week of science camps where we would do different experiments and meet different people and so I was like a, a like a leader for that like one of the adults uh, and that was awesome as well like just I, I really like teaching and I never thought that I would so that was something really fun that I also got involved in then came my second year of my undergrad and I actually had a really good relationship with one of my professors in one of my elective subjects, which was the science communication subject, which was sort of about like branching research to public policy and like communicating. So like with COVID and stuff, those people like the, the spokespeople that you see talking to the public about research and that they're science communicators. And I saw there was this option for this course that you needed approval for and you got credit for basically like helping out an academic do some kind of work whether it's like a paper or a study or whatever and I reached out to him and I was like hey is there anything that like you could you could suggest for me to do to help you with that I could get credit for and he was like actually yes 
write a chapter of this book that I have to do. Can you help me write it? And I was like, I don't think I'm qualified. But yes, so I helped him write. It was literally like him and me as the authors for this chapter of this book on science communication, which was awesome. And I probably, yeah, to be honest, it didn't take too much of my time, but it was just something else I did to like keep myself busy. And like all of these things go on your resume and set you apart from other applicants who just sort of like, you know, cruised through, the, through their degree, got good marks, but just sort of did what they had to do. They didn't put their hand up and do a whole bunch of extracurriculars, which is something that I've found to be like really, really, really beneficial. Also during my second year, I started working with a non-for-profit organization, which was technically, um, I was a science communicator. So I worked for this company that was about like educating the public on pain and how to deal with pain and raising money for like pain awareness. Like they did like bike rides and stuff. And I just wrote like blog posts for the website and I, like I sent out newsletters and stuff. And so that was really awesome and went to like a whole lot of like cool networking events and stuff. And that was great. I then became aware that the Queensland Brain Institute, so back in Queensland where I grew up, I was currently still in Canberra, had this program that was like, we admit two individuals a year to come, it's like very prestigious and you get paid, which is something super rare as an undergrad. You get paid to basically intern in a lab of your choice as long as the professor will take you in any area of research that you want. And I was like, oh my God. Again, I was like, there is no way I'm gonna get in, but you have to apply for everything because you never know. And like this just goes to show. I got in, I got the scholarship, I was getting paid more money than I had ever seen to do what I would easily do for free. Just like nine to five working in a research lab with real researchers, academics, professors in like the state of the art institution that was the Queensland Brain Institute. So I was working in a dopamine lab which was awesome, something super foreign to me. I didn't, I felt so out of place. Like I literally didn't know anything. Um, and yeah, just sort of like doing the, the, the scut work that people like, the important people don't really want to do like PCRs and just sort of like mixing solutions and you know, that sort of stuff that they don't need to do. Like it's easy enough for me to do it. So I did that actually twice for two summers in my second year and in my third year. And that was when I applied actually for a master's program, an MPhil, which is like a PHM. It can also be called, it basically stands for a master of philosophy. And a lot of people think that it's the study of philosophy, which it's not like a doctor of philosophy is not actually about philosophy. Uh, philosophy just means like finding something novel or studying something that hasn't been studied before. So someone who has a PhD uh, in biology, they're studying biology, but even though they're, they're doctorate, they're, a doctor of philosophy in biology. They don't actually do anything related to philosophy. It just means that they are studying new things about biology, if that makes sense. So an MPhil is basically a PhD, but half the size. And in Australia, you can't go from an undergrad bachelor's degree straight to a PhD. You have to either have an honors degree, which is one year, or a master's degree, which is two years. And a master's degree is considered postgraduate study, but an honors degree is not. Also, an honours degree in Australia you have to pay for and an MPhil, which is a research master's, is actually paid for by the government and you can also get, a, like, easily get a scholarship to, like, live on. And I didn't even really consider a master's, like a normal master's, like a master's of neuroscience, which is just coursework. So it's sort of similar to your undergrad where you just go and do subjects and sit in a classroom and learn and then do exams and assessments. I was not down for that. I had already done three years. I didn't want to do any more. I wanted to do research. I wanted to find something new. I wanted to work on something really novel and something that we didn't know about and actually like make a difference to the field. So I would 100%, if you're in science, recommend doing masters by research or an honors rather than doing a masters by coursework, unless that's something that you really enjoy. So during my third year of my undergrad, my last year of my undergrad, it was only a three year program, I actually got like a part-time job in an eye surgery, like an eye clinic. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool because previously I had just been working in like bars and retail at any given time during my undergrad, I had at least two jobs. I worked a lot, um, but it was really cool to get into working in something medical, even if it was just eyes, it was super random. I had not really much interest in eyes at the time. I was more like really focused on the brain and that was kind of a depressing job. I didn't really like it and I didn't get paid very well, but it was fine. I then took a subject in my last semester of my undergrad in skeletal biology. 
and I wrote a paper and it was a really good paper. I think I got the highest mark in the entire cohort and I decided that I would just write a review paper and submit it. And I did, and it got published. And so that was my first ever publication. I also then uh, submitted it to a conference and that was accepted. So I then went to a conference and presented that. And what else happened in my last year? Is that all? So I was um, accepted pretty early on into that master's program at QBI. So I moved back after I graduated. I moved back to Brisbane, started living here, started going about my master's. My master's project was in that same lab um, because I'd already had like connections and, and relationships with those people, uh, which was a dopamine lab, generally in the context of schizophrenia and autism. And my project specifically for my master's was about hypoxia, prenatal hypoxia, so pregnant woman, um, whenever she has like low oxygen, whether that's from smoking or preeclampsia or literally any kind of sort of lack of oxygen to the fetus. And we're saying that that impacts the fetus's dopamine levels permanently uh basically like rewires the dopamine neurons and how they communicate with each other and then that child then once they grow up and they hit sort of adolescence adulthood have a sevenfold increase of developing schizophrenia so that was a statistic that we knew already that everyone knew and so we were just wanting to explore why and our rationale was oh the dopamine it's you know it's affected permanently because of that low oxygen levels. So that's what I studied. I, I worked with animal models, which was something that I really, really hated and that I found really difficult. I basically vowed that if I ever did research ever again, I would never work on animals again. It wasn't for me. I hated it. Other than the ethical implications, it was literally like if my animals were giving birth at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, like I had to go in because there is, yeah, it's just, it's pretty rough. And you're constantly like checking on these animals. You're doing experiments on these animals. The hours were insane. And to be honest, it, it wasn't really a healthy working environment. During my master's, I had a super full on supervisor who like I appreciate that he was really keen and interested and engaged. And he like took on so many students, like he really was passionate about what he did. But like, for example, if I wasn't at my desk at like 5 or 6 p.m. on a Monday, he'd be like, oh, where are you? where are you? Like it was very much expected that me and all of his other students just absolutely worked. Like were there all the time, had nothing else going on outside of the program, uh, which is something that I really struggled with. And he was, to be honest, not very professional and not really a person that I would get along with in a, a personal situation. He was very obnoxious and very loud, swore a lot, swore at students, just like really, like really rubbed me the wrong way, made me really, really, really uncomfortable. Um, so big piece of advice there is if you want to do research, make sure you look very closely at the supervisor, make sure you get along, make sure that they're a nice person and they have realistic expectations. So while I was doing my masters and I just moved up here, I started volunteering with a organization that basically facilitated visitation between children and parents who for some reason like didn't have custody of their children. And like, I actually really liked that. It was something super random and super niche, but yeah, I just sort of like got to just chill and just watch kids and parents just like hang out. And I really loved that. Like I actually quite like kids. I don't want kids and I don't like annoying kids, but like I can respect children. And I really liked that experience. I then found out about volunteering at the children's hospital. Oh, that was probably like one of the best things I ever did. Um, I would still be doing it if it hadn't, the program is currently like on pause and it has been for like two years, but I did that for about a year and that was something that, that was really, really amazing. And so if you have the capacity to volunteer in any kind of way, I would definitely recommend it. Even if it was just for like two hours each week, which is what I did at the hospital, you just literally go and like play with the kids and hang out and just like sort of just do things that like the nurses are too busy for, the, the doctors are too busy for. And yeah, it's just like, I love being in that environment. So like, I'm super happy to, you know, donate my time to that. During my masters as well, I went to conferences, which I loved. I presented my research. I finally actually just really recently, even though I finished my master's program years ago, uh, a paper finally published first author paper. So that's something really fun. At least I got that out of my masters. Um, and I also shadowed a couple of neuroscientists outside the lab just to sort of get like a taste of different kinds of um, work within the scope of neuroscience. Is it really a sit down chat if my camera doesn't die? No. Where was I? I completely forgot because that was like two hours ago. Uh, 
start carrying on. Yes, so basically started my masters, just moved back to Brisbane. I started working as a casual, so like one to three days a week, depending on my schedule, as an orthoptist and an ophthalmic assistant. So, which is where I work now. So I've been there for like four years and love it. And it was gradually through the two years of my masters and working in the ophthalmology clinic where I was like, neuroscience is very grim, especially where I was working in like sort of the psychiatry side of neuroscience. Um, I did also like shadow like neurologists and things where even that was probably more grim than psychiatry where research in my opinion is just so far behind where it needs to be and you're just handing out like death sentences all day to people you know middle aged to even like children who just have like incurable brain tumors and there's very little you can do. I sort of was getting more and more turned off neuroscience and starting to sort of really explore the option of hey ophthalmology is so cool i never gave it the time of day i was like oh yeah eyes whatever just like ears or any other sort of structure in the body but oh my gosh i have learned so much working where i work the doctor that i work for is probably like the most ideal mentor anyone could ever have he loves teaching and he's so patient and yeah basically we see everything from surgery to uh, idiopathic to oncology degenerative conditions we see congenital conditions like everything that appeals to me about medicine like surgery clinic genetics trauma infection like all of it can be within ophthalmology and i love it i love it. i could talk about ophthalmology and my love for retina all day but that's not what this video is about so we're going to continue what happened then it was actually in my second year or my last year of my master's that I was nominated for the Women in STEM prize, which was like shockingly awesome, I guess. Uh, basically, it's just like an award. I didn't win and I obviously didn't expect to win. I didn't even expect to be nominated. But yeah, basically, you just like present. It's kind of like a conference type situation. And just like even to be nominated for that when I was in like my master's degree was such an honor. And so that also happened. What else happened? Oh yes, I started doing some like online courses and online certificates, um, really just to like fill up my resume and like keep my professional development and learning going while I was doing my research because obviously I wasn't doing like coursework and studying and doing exams. So I wanted to like make sure I could like still study and retain knowledge and regurgitate that. So, and I have been continuously since then doing a couple of online courses. I do them through edX and Coursera mostly. And I've got four certificates from Harvard, like online distance ed, uh, in anatomy, pharmacology, physiology, and immunology. To be honest, I'm about 50-50 as to whether they were worth it. Those ones were super expensive. I think like over a thousand dollars Australian. And, but the course was really, like the courses were really well done, I think. Um, there was lots of like patient interviews and like I don't know I think a lot of people spent a lot of time on constructing that course content which was really good course assessment was a little bit difficult um and there was like a bit of a stuff around with like my getting my certificates and testimonies and stuff but we got there in the end would I recommend it not really I'd probably recommend one of the cheaper ones I also did one from Michigan which was human neuroanatomy and I did one through Duke which was space medicine I think that's all Yes, and I'm currently doing another one in neuroanatomy, but I don't know which university that's from. And again, like I don't get credits for that or anything like formal. It's just like for funsies. I then came to the end of my master's and I was like, that's it. We're leaving neuro because neuro is depressing me and I don't want to work with animals. And most, most neuro work is with animals. So I was like, let's do ophthal. We're going to fully commit to macular degeneration and retina diseases. And so I researched and researched and found basically a professor that I was like, the work that they're doing is exactly what I want to do. The, what they're teaching is exactly what I want to teach. Like I let's go. And so I reached out to her and she was like, yeah, I don't have any students. Um, she was like pretty young for an academic. And so she's never had any students. So I would be her first, which was kind of fun. Uh, very different dynamic to my PhD. Um, but yeah, so I started with her and she is just so awesome like she is so knowledgeable but she's also like yeah work-life balance and she's just like great I absolutely yeah I could not have asked for a better supervisor um for sure for my PhD so love doing that my PhD is on I'm working on the cells of the choroid which is the layer of the eye between the retina and the sclera and 
initially the primary focus of my PhD was to do an entire single cell RNA sequencing map or atlas of the entire human choroid. And we're also going to do some flow cytometry, some wound healing stuff, and also like creating a 3D biopolymer scaffold that mimics the perfusion of the posterior eye that like works on its own and like we can have a look at cellular interactions and wound healing in an actual eye model which was really awesome uh, but about six months into my PhD someone published an entire transcriptomic atlas of the human choroid <laughs> so that was that was not fun uh, but that is definitely something that happens a lot you need to literally be reading the literature like every two days because like constantly people are churning out information churning out data and you're like oh well back to the drawing board i've done a bit of immunohistochemistry immunocytochemistry had a look at some um, protein markers and things in healthy versus macular degeneration eyeballs and wanting to have a look at some novel protein markers involved in wound healing that no one's pr previously looked at in the choroid within the context of macular degeneration. So that's fun and it's, I, yeah, it's for me. I love it. I then started in my second year, which is this year, 2022, teaching at university. So I teach first year undergraduate level um, basic sciences. So I taught human biology and anatomy and physiology at two different universities and I'll be teaching next semester as well an anatomy and physiology course for health professionals so pretty much anyone who does nursing paramedicine physio podiatry midwifery they all have to take the same like first year foundation subjects they usually include like biology or chemistry and then usually like an anatomy or physiology which is what I teach and I absolutely adore teaching I've wanted to teach for a couple of years now and in Australia it's pretty common practice that once you're a few years into your postgrad study the option usually is available to you to apply you then have an interview and yeah that's how you get into teaching I'm now going to go on to some questions that you guys sent on Instagram someone asked if I will have to do a thesis for my MD so I'm hoping to finish my PhD at the end of next year and I'm sitting the GAMSAT which is the graduate ad graduate admissions medical school uh, admission test maybe the first a is australia i don't know i don't really care basically it's this fat eight hour long exam that costs 500 dollars. you need to take it your score expires in two years you have to get a good score there's no technically pass fail really like a 50 is technically a pass but you would never get into a university if you just passed the scores are super competitive i think only like the top 10 to 20 percent even get interviews and then you maybe get uh offered to go to medical school so I'm sitting that exam in September, so in two months, and then I'll also sit it next March. It only sits twice a year in September and March where I live, and then I apply to medical school next year with my exam scores. So someone asked, well, I need to do a thesis for my MD. I will not be doing any more research um, once I already have my PhD and my MPhil. I know some programs for MD have like a semester where it's like a research project as a topic. So maybe maybe the, the person's referring to that, um, which obviously like if it's mandatory, I will do it, but I probably would prefer not to. Is the GAMSAT hard? It, it's all relative. I think that compared to, for example, the MCAT, which is the version of medical admissions test in the US is harder only because you need to actually study for that and be familiar with a lot of content whereas the GAMSAT in Australia and I think New Zealand and the UK it's more of like a standardized test problem solving type situation so the only assumed knowledge that you need is like first year undergraduate biology and chemistry and year 12 physics and it's kind of it's all multiple choice uh, you need to write two essays and the first like three hours of the test is humanities which it's not really humanities it's like a lot of english and poetry and cartoons and like answering questions about grammar and how does this person feel and what does this word mean and and sort of like critical thinking and understanding is the first section and then you write two essays in the middle section and then there's three hours of science at the end it's not like oh you have to study like medical school content and do this exam which i think a lot of people might think it is but it's not uh but yeah it's just so insanely competitive to get a high score i am hoping for something around well i mean obviously the higher the better i would love something in the 70s but realistically i'm hoping for something in the high 60s i think um that will safely get me hopefully an offer into medical school. My first preference is the University of Queensland where I live and also Griffith. What's my favorite institution that I've worked at? 
I liked UQ, but not for undergrad. I've worked at UQ, QUT, uh, and Griffith. And for undergrad science, I would probably recommend QUT, to be honest, which is something really funny because back in my day, UQ was like elite and like the fancier of all of them. But in my opinion and experience, the the curriculum is lagging. They don't have any, especially with anatomy, like in first year QUT, you have like human cadaver labs and it's just like super hands-on and like the curriculum is really good. It's a little bit intense. It's pretty, it's pretty full on and challenging, but QUT I think is really good for undergrad. I think um, it depends on what field you're in. UQ I think is good, obviously, but yeah, I think some of the buildings that like, some of the buildings at UQ are like really old and really outdated, like SBMS, um, no shade. Uh, but where I was, QBI was just like brand new, amazing. I think QUT is like really modern and they've got a lot of funding and so that's quite nice. Griffith, in my experience, I've never worked at the Gold Coast campus, only the Nathan campus and the Nathan campus is so run down compared to UQ and QT. I wouldn't really advise doing anything at Griffith unless it's at Perhaps the Gold Coast, I've heard that that campus there is really nice. Um, it's just like there's not a lot of funding and it's just like really grim and really depressing. And the only food options there is like a coffee shop and Indian, which is fine. But like you compare that to UQ and there's like 25 million sushi places, boost juice, burger places. Anyway, how much money have I spent on my degrees? That is a really good question. So I actually only paid for my bachelor's degree, which I think was about 30,000 Australian dollars, I believe. But in Australia, you don't have to like pay for your degree up front. You just get like an interest free loan and every Australian citizen is entitled to it. And you just like paid off really gradually when you start earning over a certain amount of money, it just like automatically like comes out in like really small percentages. You don't even notice it. Uh, but I did go on exchange in my last year. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. I went on exchange to Japan. I studied at the University of Tokyo and I actually got a scholarship for that trip. So if I didn't, it would be way more expensive than that. Like I said, my MPhil is paid for by the government and I also got a small living stipend, like a scholarship to like afford rent and stuff. And then PhDs in Australia are also paid for by the government and you get a uh, stipend, a uh, living salary. I've never heard of anyone who does a PhD in Australia, who's a citizen, who doesn't get the stipend. It makes it really difficult to work because you're sort of expected to be there like 38, 40 hours a week. But yeah, it's like minimum wage. It's obviously better than nothing and I'm super grateful to have it, but I think it's probably like $30,000 a year is for the duration that you're doing it full time. Do I ever feel like quitting? No, I'm in too deep. I'm too far gone now. I, my breakdown tactic was never like, oh, I'm going to quit. It would just be like, sit down and cry and then pull yourself together and be like, why am I doing this again? Oh yeah, because I'm bad. Tips to get a high GPA. Don't do science. <laughs> no, I would say, especially for medicine, you pretty much need to have a GPA of straight seven or something like a 6.9 in order to be competitive to get into medicine or get an interview. So if you can't do hard subjects like bio, chem, genetics, anatomy, and get sevens, don't do it. In Australia, you don't need to do an undergrad science degree. You can literally do any bachelor's degree and get into medical school. You can literally do like finance, you can do art, you can, it literally doesn't matter. So if that's your end goal of getting good high GPA for medical school or for whatever other reason, do something that's really easy and really cruisy, but you still enjoy. If you're not trying to get into medicine, but still want a nice GPA, um, maybe look at your study load maybe reduce that, that could help you like focus more on different subjects. Uh, did I have a really high GPA in my undergrad? <laughs> no, no, I, no, no. I think I, ha I left with like a high credit average, which like, I'm not mad about it. My first year really brought everything down. I, both of my last two years, my second and my third year was pretty much like 6.5 to seven for everything. Um, but yeah, my first year like really brought everything down because I was just too busy out drinking, which is fine. Totally fine.
Part of the reason as well, I knew that I wasn't competitive enough to get into medic medical school straight after my undergrad, uh, but I wanted to kind of do research anyway. I wanted to not be super poor. I wanted to like work and study a little bit more before I like knuckle down and do medical school. So doing a master's and a PhD was perfect for me. It makes me literally like as competitive as I can possibly be. I have like a GPA of seven at the universities that I want to go to and like bonus points and whatever. So what are the career options for neuroscience? In my experience, industry, so like private companies or research slash academia, which used to appeal to me, but after seeing it firsthand, it's all about grants, it's all about money, it's depressing, it's competitive, and it's not for me. If I wasn't in the medical field, what would I do? Teach. I love teaching. I love interacting with students, people who are just keen to learn, and like, I just, I don't know, I just love students. I love teaching so much. So I would love to be a teacher or like a lecturer or whatever or I would also love to be a food critic I feel like that would be so fun are postgraduate studies worth it it depends if you're in science and you like research 100 million percent if you are wanting to get into medical school but your GP isn't high GPA isn't high enough and you don't mind research 100 percent I think that if you are maybe not in science or in your, you're in another field or you don't like research or you don't like learning then no don't waste your time. I'm very lucky that I'm obsessed with learning and I could happily study for the rest of my life. Hence why I have studied for most of my life. Hardest part of my PhD? This is a really good question. So external factors have wreaked havoc on my mental state. Basically the ordering system, anytime I need anything for experiments like um, cells or consumables, reagents, chemicals, I have to order them and some of them take three months to come in and it's not ideal. So I just sort of have to like sit around like twiddling my thumbs, doing as doing the best I can without starting the experiment that I am just waiting for something to arrive. So that's a bit shit. Um, yeah, external factors. And a lot of the things that I need to do are on like really high tech machines with experts who need to either do the actual running of the experiment or teach me how to do it. And they're not very available. So that's a bit rough. The external factors for sure is the hardest part. Uh, and also the literature changing, like constantly having to be on top of everything. What am I doing to prepare for the GAMSAT? I'm using the Acer booklets, which are the company that make the GAMSAT. They're really the only ones that are like truly reliable because they're made at the source. There are a whole lot of companies like Fraser's, Ace GAMSAT, um, I literally can't even think of any more, Desoni or whatever, that are completely like independent. They sell like packages and materials and like seminars and stuff. And to be honest, I don't think that's necessary. And to be honest, I kind of think it's a scam. Hardest part of my academic career, psychologically, my masters. It was not a work-life balance. It was just a really stressful situation, as I mentioned earlier, just like very tense and just like a lot of pressure. So that was probably the hardest part. But academically, the hardest part for sure is GAMSAT for me. The material I don't think is difficult, like it's first year level, it's fine. But just to know how to get to the answer from the question and what you're supposed to do in between and how you're supposed to apply different things is really challenging. But yeah, I'm literally filming this at 6 o'clock and this better be up at 7 p.m. If it's not, sorry about it. Will you reattempt if you fail? You can't fail the GAMSAT, like I said. If you get under a 50, most schools consider that a fail, but like you just get a score. And even if you get like a 70, which is like top 95th percentile, you could still not get in because you don't have social skills to pass the interview. That pretty much wraps up this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you do have any questions or queries or comments, leave them below and I'll see you in the next video.